Amen. Open your Bibles this morning to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. Glory to God. Hebrews chapter 11. And let's look at verse 6. You have probably read this verse before, but I want you to be prepared to underline some things this morning. Look what it says. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Without faith, we've said this before, without faith it's impossible to please God. He is mo motivated, He's moved by your faith. Faith, without faith it's impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God, number one, must believe that He is. Now you wouldn't be here unless you believe that He is, but here's the part that most Christians fail on, is the second part. You must believe that He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him he's a rewarder and I was talking to the Lord and I said Lord I know that we have a whole lot of things that we're interested in in the church and we're dealing with miracles and a lot of things like that and he said I want you to see this if you understand miracles if you really want to understand miracles they're involved in rewards all rewards from the Lord if they come to us it's a miracle he lays cash on us as a miracle. Healing on us as a miracle. Deliverance as a miracle. He wants you to have the miracles of the Lord. So here's what he said to me. I want you to teach today on the manifested reward of God. The rewards of God. Now look at Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Now let me explain something to you. In the Bible, there's lots of principles certain principles. If you follow those principles, it will change your whole life. There's certain principles in there that you need to adapt and learn how they work and the principles can change your life. You know how in math there are certain principles, there are certain things you write down, there's a certain formula and if you follow the formula you're going to do great. God's laid down certain principles in the Bible. The principle of the Bible, now listen to me, the principle of the Bible, principles in the Bible, reveal the person of Christ. The principles of the Bible will reveal the person of Christ. And connecting the principles, the understanding the essence of the Bible, to the person of Christ is very valuable, very important, very important. The Bible says if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. So in, in Connecting the principles of the Lord unto Christ. Connecting these principles, you've seen the Father. You can see the Father. And we are after seeing it the way Christ sees it. So the principles are very important. I want you to see this in Matthew chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 5. And when thou prayest, okay now listen to me. He's getting ready to tell you how to act when you're praying. How many would like to see your prayers answered? How many would like to be more effective in your prayer life? How many would like to know how the prayers work and when they don't? When God hears your prayers? and when, uh, Some people say, I didn't know it was laid out like that. Here's principles in the Bible. You need to catch these principles and it will change the way you pray. Here it says, and when you pray, he's saying, I'm telling you what, this is a principle. Thou shalt not be like the hypocrite. Don't be like the hypocrites. Now, he's not saying you're a hypocrite. What he's saying is don't be like them. Don't be like them. Now, what is it the hypocrites do? We're going to find out. For they love to pray standing in the synagogue. They love to pray where people can see them. And in the corners of the street where somebody else can see them. That they may be seen of men. Oh, there it is explaining it exactly. Verily I say unto you, they got their reward. If you're praying where just people can see you pray, because, uh, listen, I've seen some eloquent prayers. I have, oh, I have met some people that can pray. Oh, my goodness. But if they're doing it just so other people go, oh, you're an eloquent prayer. Now, I, I can't say that about me. I may not be an eloquent prayer, but I can tell you this. I spend time in prayer life with the Lord. I go to him personally. I get myself separated so I can talk to him personally about you, about your life, about what's going on, about your relationships, about your money. You, some people say, well, how did you know that? I was talking to the Lord. And he shared some things. He told me to intercede for this particular thing. And he said, don't be like the hypocrites because they got the reward just because they said such a prayer that people could hear it. 
But thou, he says in verse 6, but thou, it's talking about you, but when you pray, enter into the closet, when thou hast shut the door, now he's talking serious here, this is not just, now there's nothing wrong with corporate prayer and getting together where everybody's praying, but he's talking about when you're praying specifically for a specific thing, he says, shut the door. And here's what it says, pray to the Father which is in secret. And look at this, and the Father which seeth in secret shall reward you openly. Now, some people say, well, I don't understand the principle of that prayer. The principle is you're supposed to pray secrets unto the Lord. These are things that just between you and Him. Some people don't have an adequate prayer life. And you say, well, what is adequate? It's more than God bless this food, amen. That's not an adequate prayer life. Now, I'm not saying that you're not supposed to pray over your food, and most people don't, but I'm saying that you're supposed to have more prayers than that. God wants you to have prayers. Now, here's something important. When you think about prayer, when you possibly think about prayer, and I can remember some times when I was growing up, and I had this thought about prayer, and I saw these wiry old gray-haired lady, wiry old hair sticking all over the place, and I'd look at this and I'd say, well, if I'm, I don't want to be like that, you know, that's, 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 a, well, that's mama, that's mama, whoever they call her, mama something, and she gonna, she's a prayer warrior. And I'd say, mm-hmm, well, I don't want to be like that because I'm going to end up some old woman somewhere. I said, I, when I get a, a conjuring in my mind of what prayer's about, as I was being raised, it was always for somebody else to do. The prayer warrior will take care of that. The prayer ladies come together for that. It wasn't something that we had to have a personal connection with God to be able to deal with something. So when I conjured up an image, there was a concept in my mind what prayer was about. But listen to me. Prayer means a conversation with God. It's a conversation with God. Resulting life comes out of that conversation. If you don't have a very good spiritual life, I'll tell you, you probably don't have a good prayer life. Amen. Amen. Now, some people say, let me scoop my toes back just a little bit here. <laughs> you better get your toes up off the floor because the Lord told me how to, exactly what I'm supposed to say today to encourage people to get into a prayer life. Amen. 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 The resulting connection with God comes from your prayer life. Jesus helps us identify some things that we need to see. Right here he says, look at this. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't be like the hypocrites. They do it to be seen. They do it and they've got their reward. But he says, go into the room, shut the door, and the Father which, which hears you in secret will reward you openly. Now, there's two ways to talk to God. He says so right here, principles. Number one, produces nothing. What's that way? It's a way that you're just doing it to be open so somebody else can see your eloquence. So somebody else, it's not praying to God. It's just talking in such a way somebody heard you. And they're, they're, they're saying, oh, he prays so good. Oh, I love to hear him pray. That's not what we're praying for. I can't say that people hear me, they say, I love to hear you pray. I'm praying for people sometimes, and I've got a hold, I'm right here. I say, I only try to do what the Father tells me to do, only saying what the Father tells me to say. And I remember one time, Oh, listen, I fasted for a whole week. I got ready for a prayer. This guy had muscular dystrophy. And the Lord had me fast for a whole week. Then he said, come over and lay hands on him and pray for him. And the prayer of faith will raise him up. I said, Jesus, yes. The whole week went by, I fasted. Man, I'll tell you what, that was a strong fast. The whole week, the whole week, a whole week without food. Anybody miss a meal ever? Anybody miss two? Come on. Anybody ever gone without food for a week? If you ever gone without food for a week on purpose, I'll tell you what, you have to stay in prayer to keep from thinking about burgers and, and french fries and, and, and pasta. It's just the way it is. But if you focus on the things of the Lord, and I went over there, I'll tell you what, I was full of faith and power, and I said, I'm going to pray for you. Come over here, right here, sit down right here. I said, oh Lord God, tell me exactly what to pray and I'm going to pray for this man. Oh, I could, I could tell that. His eloquence was just whack, 
waxing on me. I was ready to go and I said, Lord, that I might have the power to pray the prayer of faith that saves the sick. And I said, Lord, tell me what to pray. I put my hands on him and I said, in Jesus' name, be healed. I said, that was a whole week of fasting for that? <laughs> that was it? I said, be healed. And he looked up at me and he said, is that it? I said, that's all there is. I said, I did exactly what the Lord told me to do. I said, in the name of Jesus, you're healed. He said, I'll tell you one. I go to the doctor on Monday. I'll tell you exactly what the Lord said. I said, I'll tell you what. I'll drive you so that you can declare the report of the Lord. He said, you'll drive. I said, I'll drive you. Because he's going to go in there and you're going to tell the man, it was the Lord Jesus that healed me. And he looked at me and he said, really? I said, I'll pick you up. What time's your appointment? 9 o'clock. I said, I'll be here, 8.30. We're going over there. We're going to see the man. We got there at 9 o'clock. Sure enough, he took him in for tests. He took him in to find out the final number of the dystrophy that he had. We went through tests. Two hours went by. Four hours went by. Six hours went by. He finally came out and he says, they're finally done. They ran so many tests on me and they said, something wrong. We can't find it. I said, what did I say? Go in there and tell him it was the Lord that healed you. Now let's get in the car and let's go home. I got to eat. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's just the way it is. And the man was healed. Now, there's some powerful thing involved if you do what the Father says to do. Learn how to pray. One produces nothing. If you're praying a prayer just because you want somebody else to hear, you're going to produce nothing. But the right kind of conversation with God, the right kind of conversation with God always manifests rewards. The Bible says, it, I will reward those that diligently seek me. He always manifests rewards. And there should be. And there can be. And there will be a reward from the Father in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, right conversation always produces a reward. Now, I've, I've had people come to me and they said, Well, I'm not after the rewards. Glory to God. I just want to be closer to the Lord. I just want to be closer to the Lord. I don't need the rewards. Listen to me. If you're close to the, to the Lord, you can't help but swim in the rewards of the Lord. If you're close to the Lord, He lavishly pours out rewards upon us. He's an abundant God. He's pouring out blessings abundantly on us in Jesus' name. Health and healing. I've had people tell I, well, I, I just want close to the Lord. You can't help it. If you want health and healing, if you don't even pray for it, He's going to pour it out to you. He's trying to give it to you more than you want it. Amen. Prosperity and wealth. Oh, listen, I've had people fight this for me for 36 years. They say, there's no oh, man, you know, you're one of those prosperity preachers. Well, Jesus was a prosperity preacher for heaven's sake. He preaches abundance. He came to give us abundant life and you can have it more abundantly. And then people say, well, I just want God. If you want God, you're going to get the rewards. Amen. That's where all the other stuff comes from anyway. The closer to God, He pours out things upon us in Jesus' name. You can't resist getting your bills paid. If you're close to the Lord, your bills will be paid. He promises your closeness to the Lord will pay your bills. He said, I want all your needs met according to my riches and glory of Christ Jesus. How many say, well, yeah, I went in on that. Come on now. I went in on that. All your needs met in Jesus' name. All that there is, is in Him. In Genesis 15.1, Genesis 15.1, God was talking to Abraham and He said, After these things the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, and it said, Fear not, Abraham, fear not. I will be your shield and exceeding great reward. I'm pouring out rewards. Now I'm talking about reward. What is a reward? It's the beginnings of understanding miracles. If you're standing in line for your reward, I guarantee you it's a miracle. Amen. You're going to get a miracle from the Lord. Matthew 6 and verse 7. And we were talking about Matthew 5, Matthew 6 and verse 5, Matthew 6. And we're now in Matthew 6 and verse 7. Matthew 6 and verse 7. He says, don't you dare, when you pray, don't you dare use vain repetitions because the heathens do that. Now some people, what do you mean vain repetitions? Repeating yourself over and over and over and over as if the Lord is deaf. Because he didn't pray it unto the Lord in faith. 
You're praying it just because you want to get it out. Oh God, help me. Oh God, oh God, oh God, help me. Oh God, oh God, oh God, help me. And that's the beginning of a song, isn't it? Ooga, ooga. It doesn't sound right. Are you with me? You're just, you're not praying it to the Lord. It's not like having a conversation. I wouldn't go, oh Dan, help me, Dan, Dan, help me, Dan, help me, Dan, Dan, help me, help me, help me, Dan. Could people go, what's wrong with you? But we do it to the Lord all the time. Because we're not having a conversation with God. We're having a hypocritical conversation, which is not what you get rewards from. Amen. And he says, when you pray, don't do it with vain repetitions like the heathens do, because they think that they'll be heard by their much speaking. Somehow God will throw that against the wall, and one of those things will stick. That's not God. He says, I want you to pay attention that there's some prayers that produce nothing. You pray it over and over, you're producing nothing. But what produces life is when you pray a prayer with a good conversation with God. Our life is to be lived with an extremely good conversation to God. And I can guarantee you that's where the Christian life needs to move. You need to have the Word. That's the most powerful because the Word is the... He even honors His Word above His name. You hold His Word. You're supposed to read the Word. But then you need to learn how to have a great conversation with God. Some people have had a limited conversation with God. If you have a limited conversation, let's say with your spouse, do they know you? Do they even know what you think? Do they know... Do you know what they think? No, because you have a limited conversation. I know one man and he talks to his wife like this. Yeah. No. Mm-hmm. Sure. He does that one word answer thing. That's his entire conversation. What do you think they've learned from that? Each other, they've learned nothing. Because they don't have a, a proven conversation. Now, our life is to have some kind of response towards God. Believing is a response to God. Believing is a response to God. Unbelieving is a response to God. Some people believe, some people do not believe. The believer looks at the Word and declares, This is all the evidence I need. I believe what He said. Amen. Amen. The non-believer looks at the Word and says, I don't know. This doesn't look like there's, there's not enough proof in this word here for me to believe. Amen. But the Lord wants you to believe. Now look at James. James. James chapter 1. Oh, I love the book of James. I've read the book of James probably more than any other book in the Bible. The book of James thrills me. <laughs> I don't know why, but it just does. James chapter 1. I want you to look at verse 2. My brethren, he's talking to you and me. He's talking to the sister and too. My brethren, he's talking to all of us. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, tests, and trials. These are random trials. Anybody ever had to deal with a random trial? You're doing pretty good and all of a sudden something hits you from the blind side. It's a random trial. It's something you didn't expect. Count it all joy when you fall into this kind of trial. You have no idea where it came from. You have no idea why you're dealing with it. You have no idea what you're going to do about it. But here it is anyway. You're surrounded with it. Yeah. Anybody ever dealt with something like that? Anybody ever had something happen? You go, where'd that guy, how'd that happen? What were they thinking? How'd that, how did this possibly come up on me? And why is this happening right now? We've all had to deal with stuff like that. It happens at the weirdest times. There's no good time to have a bad situation. And when the bad situation comes, the thought comes, how, how am I going to deal with this? How am I going what, what do I need to do? Come on, anybody ever gone into panic mode three? Come on. You're just, you're doing pretty good, and, and you do pretty good, but then you get yourself calmed down, you're doing okay. You're doing okay, but man, the thoughts come immediately again. And it's like, wait a minute, why am I so anxious? Why am I so, why is this doing this to me? Because when we don't know what to do, we're supposed to count it all joy. The source of joy, you do not, when you do not know something, when you say, I don't know what this is. I don't know how this came. I don't know why this is here. I don't know why they're doing this to me. It doesn't bring you that kind of joy. The source of joy is in verse 3. Verse 3. Look at James chapter 1, verse 3. 
We don't know certain things, but we do know this. Know this, know this, that the trying of your faith works patience. Works patience. Some people say, I, I don't need any more patience. Wait a minute. <laughs> you better get some patience on this situation. The trying of your faith works patience. We get anxious about many things. But he said, you better get some patience on this thing. The trying of your faith works patience. Know this, that the trying of your faith works patience. Whenever things come to you and start to get you messed up, start to get you thinking on something else, you don't know, you don't know, you don't know. And we say it out loud, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. You ought to be saying, I do know this, that this trial will lead to more patience. Do you think we should respond like that? Every time. Do you think we do? Never time. <laughs> Not at all. But he says, I want you to do this. Let patience have her perfect work. Then you will be entire and complete and want nothing. Sounds like a miracle involved to me. Yeah. Anybody say, that sounds like a miracle to me. Yeah. Entire, that's a miracle. Complete, that's a miracle. That's mature. And have no wants. Come on, somebody say, that's a miracle. I'll do, I went in on that one. Yeah. I went in on that one. How do you get there? You got to quit trying to figure out what are you going to do. What are we going to do about this? How am I going to fix this? How am I going to make this change? How am I, how am I going to work on this? He says, know this, that this trial, that this test, that this temptation, that what you're going through is the manifested glory of God is going to be on the other side. He said, know this, this trial will lead to patience. And patience is going to have a perfect work and you're going to be complete. It's going to be done. Amen. When you don't know what to do, you've got to hold on to God. Because otherwise, if you meditate on what you do not know, it'll make you depressed. When you meditate on what you do not know, you'll feel down. You'll feel discouraged. You'll tell other people, I just don't know what to do. Now, let me ask you a question. Anybody know what a person encouraged, a real encouraged person in the Lord looks like? He has his shoulders down, right? He shuffles his feet when he walks. He talks with a slur, and it's kind of slow. You say, well, that's a depressed person right there. Oh, you can identify him? That's a depressed person? But we spend a lot of time looking like a depressed person, don't we? <laughs> but he said, don't do that. That's the way the hypocrites do. They want somebody to see them. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. But he said, when you pray, and you're praying, he said, don't do like the hypocrites. You pray like this, Father, I'm praying to you, and I thank you that this situation will turn out in a good result in Jesus' name. Patience that I'm receiving will have its perfect work. You cannot meditate on what you don't know. Instead, rejoice over the things that you do know. Rejoice over that the Lord is working patience in you. And the strength of the Lord and the joy of the Lord has been reserved completely for you. Yes. Amen. Yes. Even if you don't know where this junk came from, even if you don't know how come they're continuing in this manner. He said, you let patience have its perfect work. You're going to be complete and tired and want nothing. Amen. Amen. The testing of this faith will produce patience. Look at verse 4. Let patience have her perfect work. Then you will be entire and complete and want nothing. Verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom. You know what? When I used to read this verse... I always separated verse 5 from verse 2, 3, and 4. I'd read 1, 2, 3, 4, and I'd say, okay, praise God, if I'm going through a test or a trial, hallelujah, I can let patience have a perfect work, end of, end of sentence, start a new paragraph. And then I'd say, I'm going to need some wisdom. If anybody's wisdomless, you need some wisdom on anything, ask of God, let me give you a preference to what the Lord told me today. He said, don't separate verse 5 from 2, 3, and 4. Verse 5 is the cultivation of 2, 3, and 4. If you don't know what to do, you know what you need? Wisdom. If you don't know how this thing's going to change, you know what you need? Wisdom. If you don't know where this came from, you know what you need? Wisdom. If you don't know what to do, and you're at the worst place you've ever been, you know what you need? Wisdom. He said, when you're going through a trial, what you need is wisdom. Because with wisdom and the Lord, you can get through anything. You got wisdom, you can make it happen. And look what he says. If any of you lack wisdom, if you don't know what to do, 
task of God. How many's ever gone through a trial and you didn't know what you're doing? You're almost getting to the end of it and you're, you're just pulling your hair out trying to figure out what do I do? And like the Lord was laying plans out for you all the time, but you didn't just specifically ask him, what do you want me to do? I'm going to tell you, write this down. Ask him, ask, what do you want me to do? Some people say, oh, I'm getting ready to go to this place and I'm going to move over here. Did you ask? Ask him. If you're sitting in a situation where there's a trial and there's a test, you got to say, what do you want me to do? And here's what he says. When you ask him, he giveth, look at this, to all men liberally. Notice that doesn't say just to Christians. Notice that doesn't say just to born again people. He will give it to men all the time. Why? He's trying to get wisdom to you because he shows you by wisdom you need to be born again. Amen. Amen. He's giving it to all men. Look at this word. Liberally. Now what's liberally mean? Man, good thing you came this morning. Here's what it says. Here's the definition. Write this down. If you've got a pen, put it down. Liberally. Liberally. Lavishly. No reserve. Generously. Large proportions. Plenty. Ample. Abundance. Tremendous reward. Whoa. Wait a minute. What? If he's given it to you liberally, it's more than you can even imagine. Now, here's how he told me. Here's how he told me. I got a situation. I don't know what to do. And so he says, all right, I'm going to take care of that situation. And I go, okay, okay. I'm good. And he, ha he handles it, pours out a little bit. And I got it taken care of. I go, okay, I'm good. And then he says, wait a minute. I'm not done yet. Hold your tongue. I'm going to give you a little bit more. But, but I got it all taken care of. But I'm not done. I'm giving it to you liberally. It's more than you can imagine. It's lavishly. It's over and above. It's everything and then some. And he keeps pouring it out. I say, oh God, I don't even have room enough to contain it. And he says, wait a minute. I'm not done yet. I'm going to pour out some more. That's lavish. Amen. That's liberally. And he says, I'm going to give it to you when you're neck deep in stuff from me and you're saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. And he says, then we're not done. I'm going to pour out some more. Yeah. That's liberally. Has anybody ever received that message from the Lord before? That's liberal. He said, I'm pouring out something to you, can't even imagine. And I've had people tell me in 36 years of ministry, you probably have heard this, well, I'm not looking for a handout. And the Lord said, if that ever shows up again, tell him this, then you better go get you a new God because my God's in the handout business. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> he wants to get blessings to you more than you need the blessing. He's trying to get prosperity to you. He's trying to get healing to you. He's trying to get deliverance to you. He wants to pour out things abundantly in your life more than you can imagine so you become a testimony of others about the Lord. Amen. He wants to show himself big in you and pour out manifested rewards. When people say, I'm not looking for a reward, I'll tell you what, you better get this in mind. Then you don't need to be serving our God because he's in the reward business. Amen. Romans 8 and 32, it says, look at this. Romans 8 and 32. You better get this in your Bible. <laughs> Romans 8 and 32. He that did not spare his own son, he that did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give you all things? Now, which part of that did you not get? He said he's going to give you liberally all things. He also said, I'm going to pour out to you liberally. He's going to give you wisdom liberally. He's going to pour out all things liberally. He's trying to tell you something this morning that you have not heard before. You have not even tapped into what he wants to give to you. We are so light in receiving from our God. We, we say, well, God's such a great God. Wait a minute, you need to get a whole different mindset. He wants to give it to me. You need to say that. Come on, with me. He wants to give it to me. Everybody do like this. He wants to give it to me. Let's do it again. He wants to give it to me. Now that starts to make sense. When you see it like that, you realize he's trying to bless us. Amen. And your conversation with God needs to change. He's willing to give. He's ready to give. And he wants to give it to me. 
Oh, that changes your whole conversation with God. When you're dealing with healing, he, He's willing to give. He wants to give, and He's trying to give it to me. He wants to give it to me. If He's trying to take care of finances, oh, He's willing. He wants to, and He wants to give it to me. Hallelujah. And we've already known. And now listen. I was talking to the Lord about some things. We got to this part, and He told me this. And he said one thing that he'll never say. One thing the Lord will never say. And I said, what would that be? He'll never say, you're asking for too much. Amen. Some people say, well, I must have asked for a car that was just out of my league. You'll never come to a point where you're asking for too much. This is a big God. You're not asking for something that's too much. And he said, listen to me. I will never say, check with me again next month. This isn't a good month. <laughs> <laughs> that's not going to come across his lips. But we say sometimes he's telling me to wait. If you pray according to his will, and you know what the will of the Lord is. He said, if you pray according to my will, you will have the petitions that you pray. You have not spent time in conversation with God to find out what His perfect will is for you or you would have all your prayers answered. Amen. Are you with me? Let's get our prayer life in a stronger manner than ever before. Amen. If you lack wisdom, ask, ask, ask. He said, I'm going to pour it out liberally in such a manner that you can't, you have more than enough. You'll have everything answered, everything completely answered. Now, he said this specifically. Any time in the Bible that you see the word gave, or gift, or given, or give. He said, I want you to hear one word. Whenever you hear give, or give, gift, or given, he said, I want you to hear one thing. The word is grace. It's unmerited favor. It's a reward I pour out. I gave unto you. I'm giving you something. I poured out something to you. I'm giving you something more than you deserved. I'm just giving it to you. Amen. So if he's pouring out grace, and grace is a gift of God. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. Grace is the gift of God. In 1 John, it says it about 15, grace came to us through Jesus Christ. And it says this in 1 John, in John 1, it says Jesus is the manifest, manifestation of the grace of God to you. Amen. The manifested grace of God to you. That's in John chapter 1. Grace is everything that comes to us through Christ. So if you got something through, through Christ, it was given to you by grace. He gave it to you by grace. You didn't deserve it. If it was given to you from Jesus, it was given because you didn't deserve it. Salvation is that way. Salvation, now listen to me. Let's see if I can say this right. Salvation is the gift from God to you through Christ. Salvation is the gift of God to you through Christ. Are you with me? Now, if that is true, therefore you are saved by grace. Because grace comes through the manifested presence of Jesus and it says salvation, the gift of God to you through Jesus. Are you with me? Alright, now, now listen. Healing Healing is a gift from God. If healing is a gift from God, it's a gift from God to you through Christ. It came by grace. So healing comes to us by grace. So if somebody says to me, well, it doesn't say that you're going to get all healed. Yes, it does. Healing was the manifested grace of God. It comes to us because Jesus gave it to us. Amen. You have the healing of God. Prosperity. Oh, I've been fought on this for years. Prosperity is the gift of God to you through Christ. It happened through Christ. It's the grace of God is pouring out favor. It's lavishly given to you. It's the gift of God to you through Christ. Amen. 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 Now if you're not receiving prosperity, I'm going to say you need to change some of your prayer life. You need to get close. He's trying to pour out rewards upon you. He's trying to give you this more than you want it. How many would say, oh I want to get in that line. How many are willing to learn the aspect that you can get into the prosperity message and really have prosperity happen in your life? If it's supposed to, and it is, then you need to get there. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. 
It says it like this. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, amen, though he was rich for your sakes became poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. He wants richness on you and it's given to you by grace. Amen. 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 Well, yes, Father, I'll do that. Amen. Well, we've got to stop. <laughs> Are you ready for that? Yeah. Hallelujah. I'll just, I'll, hey, we better just follow the Lord, don't you think? Amen. Amen. He said we've got a few things to pray for this morning, so we better pray.